Thank you, Chris. Thank you, choir. Thank you for letting me come today. It's good to be here. The last time I was here was at Alan and Chris's ordination, and uh, I told you that I had almost forgiven you for coming down to Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and bringing him up here. I'm here to report today that I have totally forgiven you now that I'm the retired pastor of Silver Springs Baptist Church, and uh, he was instrumental in me coming today. I appreciate your pastor during the last less than two years. He and I have been become pretty good friends, and I count him as a, one of mine. We want to pray for him this morning as he is serving the Lord in another church uh, uh, preaching there. Psalm 103 is where we're opening our Bibles today, a very familiar past psalm, a psalm that is... Uh, is dear to our hearts, and I want to take a section just out of the middle, a chunk out of the middle, starting with verse 13, and uh, read from there. But let's pray first, shall we? And then you finish finding that passage in your Bible if you haven't already got it. By the way, you got the sermon outline. Chris suggested this, and the sermon outline will be in a miniature form on the uh, uh, screens. Uh, he suggested that as well. And the reason is, some of you might want to take some notes. If that bothers you, you don't like doing that, just forget that piece of paper there. The sermon on the screen is there, so if you fall asleep in this message and you think, I wonder if he's making progress, and you wake up in point number three, then you'll know that I'm making progress this morning. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this great church, for the work it does around this world joining hands with uh, thousands of other Southern Baptist churches. Thank you, Lord, for our missionaries that are scattered abroad and uh, in our own country and even in our state. Lord, we thank you for the pastor. We pray, Lord, as he may even be preaching now, that you would give him freedom in the pulpit there at Lebanon Missionary Baptist Church. I pray further, Lord, that there might be freedom here for the Holy Spirit to move into every pew from the outside to the inside, from the front to the back, up into the balcony. And Lord, we'd be attentive to what you want us to know and what you want us to hear this day. Lord, I pray that when we come to the decision time, that, Father, our hearts and our lives will be so stirred that if you're speaking to us, we'll have to make that decision even publicly this morning, that you want us to make. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen. We're looking at verse 13, reading down through verse 17 of the scripture. Uh, as a father, some translations say pities. The idea is compassion. It's not that God is looking at us and saying, you know, oh, you poor pitiful soul. He has compassion as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And as for man, his days are like grass, as flowers of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place is remembered, no more. Now, if that has totally depressed you, verse 17 will lift you out of depression. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. I want to talk to you today about death's reminders. Death's reminders are all around us. If you have already looked at the bulletin, or if you're doing that right now, you'll notice that three families in this congregation have been touched by death in some way this morning. Uh, we drove here from the motel, and we passed on Broad Street, Broadway, Oakwood Cemetery. That is another reminder of death, and I'm not the only one. There are two funeral homes here in Mount Vernon that I know of, and every time we go there, that's a reminder that death is no respecter of person. We don't like to talk about death, because we want to try to avoid that, we want to live, and those of us who are Christians have a better outlook on death than what 
those who have no hope. However, sometimes in our fleshly selves, we have a misconception about death. And so today, I want to talk to you about death's reminders. Did you see it there in verse 15? As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field so flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it's gone, and its place remembers it no more. We see here that what he's talking about is something that all of us have to face. You might think, well, I'm young. It's going to be a long time. You know, I read the obituary column. And if I find my name in there, I vow that I'll go back to bed and stay in bed the rest of the day. But the truth of the matter is, I read even the youngest of obituaries in the paper. In fact, in uh, Mount Vernon, I saw the obituaries of some very young people as I looked at the obituary columns this morning. You see, we understand that we're temporal. Someone said, you know, I uh, was moving to Arizona and asked the realtor, said, uh, showing them houses, what is the death rate in Arizona? And the realtor said, why, it's the same as anywhere else, one per person. And you and I need to understand that one of these days, we are candidates for passing that way. So it's important that as we think about that, the certainty of our death, that we should live by three statements that I want to share with you this morning. The first statement is we need to enjoy every day. I don't know who it is or who it was. You've got to be careful up here if you want to move. It's a short span. If, uh, I don't know who it was but that started thinking and purporting that we Christians should, can't have any fun. I was told that very early after becoming a Christian, you know, that, that you know, preachers, after becoming a preacher, that preachers shouldn't have any fun. I want to tell you something. Nobody ought to enjoy life any more than this bunch in this room and in, all, in churches across America. We should enjoy life. There's, it's not a sin to enjoy life, but sometimes we just kind of look at life as the glass is half empty. In reality, though, the glass is half full. We focus on the difficulty. You know, we, you know in, on the weather report, it's, they, they'll say it's going to be partly cloudy. Well, if it's partly cloudy, isn't it partly sunny? And why don't they just say it's going to be a partly sunny day instead of a partly cloudy day? We are born and we are developed in the negative. I like what Tim Tebow said. He said, I really enjoy life and have joy with what I do. That's the way we ought to do. The Christian life should be one of real joy. There are so many verses of Scripture that purports that we ought to be people of joy. And just for the sake of time, and you'll say amen to this, I just want to share with you five of them. Amen? Just five. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. The proverb says, An evil man is snared by his own sin, but a righteous one can sing and be glad. We have given the idea of joy over to the wicked people in our land. I mean, the folks that are in the beer parties, the drug parties, uh, the television shows us that that's the way the, how do they portray the, oh, us as a Christian? We look like we've been in the prune juice all night long. We, we need to understand that we're the ones that have the captivity on this thing of joy. joy. In the New Testament, Acts 13, 52 says, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Second Chronicles, or Corinthians 7, 4, Paul says, I have great confidence in you, and I take pride in you, and I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. And finally, the admonition in Philippians 4, 4, that says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul says it again. Again, I say, rejoice. At the age of two, Lila May Show of Hood River, Oregon, was diagnosed with neuro, neuroblastoma, a deadly cancerous disease. In July of 2015, the doctors told Lila May's heartbroken parents that she was too weak to continue on with treatment that they would hope would extend her life. Her family and her community rallied 
around this little five-year-old girl, and uh, they uh, had a birthday party bash that was out of this world. Somebody gave her a trip to Hawaii. She was named the princess of uh, Hood River, and they threw a prom for her, things that she might would have gotten to do, but now because of this terrible disease, she would not do. In fact, she had a wedding ceremony where her father had, uh, walked her down and married her uh, even though she was just five years old. There was one last dream that Lila May had, and that was to dance with the country music star, Luke Bryan. When Bryan learned of this dream, he called Lila May to talk with her. Then he recorded a special video message for Lila. And the last thing he did, he knew of her dream to dance with him, so he got her VIP uh, tickets with her parents to one of his concerts. However, she did not make it. She was too weak and shortly died. She, he was going to have her to sing with him her favorite song, That's My Kind of Night. The People magazine concluded their article on Lila May and all that had happened. Thanks to the support of her community, last, Lila May's last months were filled with moments of real joy. Now, I don't know if all that is what I would call real joy. I'm glad it made the young lady very happy. But we Christians really have an opportunity to in, live life with real joy. Now, when I'm talking about real joy, I'm not talking about the finer things of life, no problems, no negativity in our lives, with plenty of everything. I'm talking about living the way the Lord wants us to live. That is where real joy is. That is uh, being committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, as we sang, Lord of all. You see, we need to understand that that's where it is that we find real joy in life. And then as we learn more about Him, as we monitor our lives and we give our lives to this blessed book and read it and find it, we remove some things in our life that short circuits the joy in our lives. Things like bitterness and jealousy, envy, deceitfulness, falsehoods, lies, and un an untrusting spirit. You see, those are things that if we put them in our lives, we hold on to them, and we think, I'm going to love this bitterness. It will short-circuit the joy in our lives. How many Christians, some that I may be speaking to here this morning, your lives have been short-circuited, your joy has been short-circuited because of these six things that you hold on to. Not only are we to be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, not only do we need to remove these six things in our lives so we might experience joy, but we need to realize that even in the bad the bad time, that it can be good. It's a Romans 8.28 attitude. For we know that God works together for good in the lives of those who love Him. And you and I need to understand that. I didn't say God causes everything to happen. If you've had a bad week, your transmission just quit, your house, you know, uh, you found out you had termites in your house, your kids are going wild or anything like that. I'm not saying God causes those things. But what I am saying to you is that God can work through even the worst of circumstances to grow us and make us in more of the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, who was filled with pure joy even on the cross. I think another thing that helps us to have real joy in life is when we focus on others. Something about us makes us turn inward. It's all about me. How many of us have told our children, I'll tell you there, little iodine, it's not all about you. Have you ever said that to your kids? Look, can I see a hand testimony? Yeah, it's not about you. you some of you said that, others of you say, I wish I'd said that years ago. As I was putting the Board of Education on their seat of learning, you know, it, we, but we want everything to focus on us. We want to be the center of the party. We want to be where everybody comes to us and says, but listen, my friend, when we do that, we short-circuit the joy that we can have in our life. One more thing that will bring us real joy, and that's to live by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we talk about that a lot. It's a lot harder done than said. It, we can, 
it just seems like we fall apart. We think when the world's going apart, falling apart, we, we just think, oh, man, I just don't know what we're going to do. And when we think like, I don't know what we're going to do, it's, we need to say, I'm going to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. So, because of death's reminders, we ought to be remembering to enjoy life. Nothing wrong with it. I love living life. I'm ready to go, but I love living life. The second thing I want to say to you that death should remind us to do, and that's to live so there are no regrets. There are no regrets. Now, every one of us in this room, every youth, every adult, even some children that went out a while ago, we have regrets. We have regrets because of bad decisions. I've made some bad decisions throughout life, made a lot of good decisions, especially the number one decision I made was trusting Jesus as my Savior. We, we have some regrets because of our uh, role in interpersonal conflicts. We haven't handled them right. We spouted off whenever we should have been more gracious. We have some regrets because we procrastinated to do something, and the opportunity got away from us. Now, all of us are going to have re regrets, but what I'm talking about is that we don't have a life filled with regrets. That that is not our mantra. That is not the norm for us. And I believe it is possible. There are some people that have a lot of regrets because of what they do. There was a young lady that uh, was going awry, and somebody said to her, godly Christian parents, well, you raised her right. You know, you're going, she's going to be all right. She'll come back. She'll understand. And the response of the daddy was, that you can't say that. You don't know what will happen to her. And furthermore, she's going to live with a mound of regret. Ada Whitmire was 39 years old, and she was in prison for murdering two of her husbands. If she came to you and said, I'd like to marry a guy, don't be number three, whatever it is. I mean, you don't want to be number three. And you don't have to worry about that anymore because in 1984, she was in a Tennessee state penitentiary on death row. But before death row could happen, before her execution could happen, Ada hung herself in her cell. They found her last letter. It was filled with regret. More than one TV cameraman captured many times the tears of regret that streamed down her face. She committed suicide. Listen, living in constant misery and saying it's so bad that I've got to take my own life or just living that way, just depressed all the time because of the regret you have is not the only option that you have. Whenever a person is right with Jesus Christ, then my friend, he can help us with our regrets. He cannot change the history. He does not change the history. What happened, happened. My thumb right here, in, uh, when I was in the eighth grade, we went to St. Louis on our eighth grade school trip, and we was up there, and I cut that thumb halfway off. You know, I can remember that, but I can't change that. But it doesn't really bother me because I got a good sew-up job in the hospital in East St. Louis. The best place they said for stab, stabbings and gunshot wounds back then was the hospital in East St. Louis. And a St. Louis policeman said, you take him across the river, that's the best place. They know what they're doing. And I want to tell you, they do. They did. I can't change that thumb. I can't change that scar. Every time I see that scar, I remember the eighth grade at El Dorado Junior High School. I remember that eighth grade school trip, and I remember the dumb thing I did. But I can handle it. And whatever your regret is, you say, Russ, you just don't know what my regret is. You don't know what all mine could be. In God's grace, our regrets can be handled. You see, past failures and sins are forgivable. So regret can be minimized. It may be a part of our history. We cannot erase that, but no one can hold it against us. Satan himself cannot condemn us any longer because it's been covered in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary's cross. When we live our lives, though, what we want to do is to live our lives in obedience because when we live in obedience, 
to the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't have to live in regrets. We don't have no regrets about what we've done. There's no regrets in serving the Lord. Don Monex is sitting right over here. And Don, years ago at another church, I was teaching a group of boys. And one of those boys was saved, maybe many of them. And to die, today he's preaching at the Raleigh Baptist Church, Roy Del Orr. Let me tell you something, my friend. I would say you go up to Don Monex, even those, those yahoos probably about drove him half crazy. He has no regrets when he sees an image like that. Am I right about that, Don? We didn't talk about this before the service, uh, but I tell you, there's no regrets when you're teaching a class and you're investing your time. There's no regrets whenever you give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. You may not know what that cup will do in, uh, until eternity, but you have no regrets. You have no regrets for being a verbal witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, even though somebody says, no, I don't want your Jesus, even though somebody might make fun of you. There are no regrets for being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are no regrets about what we will have missed. I mean, I don't miss being saying, I'm an alcoholic, or I'm a drug addict, I'm hung out on opioids, or something like that. Who would miss, miss that kind of life? Who would miss having to look over your shoulder all the time because you're so wrong to other people that somebody is always coming after you? The reminders of death remind us all that we see around, whether it's in the obituary column, uh, column at a cemetery, or just the memories that we have, the flowers that may be at church, every one of those ought to remind us that we can live life without regrets. One more thing. Whenever we look around, we see death all around us. It should remind us that we should accept Jesus Christ today if we have not. There are probably in a group this size, either on the main floor or in the balcony, maybe somebody that's here for the first time, maybe somebody that has come here several times, someone that is seeking a life with Jesus Christ, or seeking the wholeness of life, someone maybe that came in and said, you know, I've heard that they're different there at Logan Street. I want to go see what it's about. It could be somebody that has a church membership here or somewhere else. But somehow, you never trusted Jesus Christ today. All of death's reminders should remind us to accept Jesus Christ, not one of these days, but today. There are a lot of folks that say, well, you know, I'll uh, accept Christ one of these days, but not today. You may feel that way because there's one pet sin that you have, or maybe several pet sins, or problematic sins, and you think, I've got to get that all straightened out. I've got to get that all worked out. I've got to get that all under control. My friend, don't let Satan sell you that lie. You trust Christ today. There are some folks that have been taught wrongly that you have to maybe be perfect before you can be uh, a Christian, or you've got to work your way to heaven. You maybe have heard of Merle... Travis, the great guitarist, Chet Atkins, if you hadn't heard of Merle, uh, Merle Travis. Mose Rager taught Merle Travis how to play the guitar, that thumb and picks uh, style. He was influential on Chet Atkins. Chet Atkins and Merle Travis would come to see him. I saw them in Drakesboro, Kentucky when I was pastor there. had a little conversation with them at Mose's house. But Mose Rager was taught wrong. He was taught that you had to be perfect to be a Christian. If there, that was true, there wouldn't be a Christian in this world and heaven would be emptied of people because all of us are sinners saved by grace. Some people intend to become a Christian. Maybe you're this way. You think, well, one of these days I will, but I just never got around to it. Is there anything you've never gotten around to? You, you know, I used to carry, I, I had some things made up one time and around to it. People said, well, preacher, I'm going to come to church when I get around to it. And it had the word to it, T-U-I-T on it. And it was round and I'd hand that to them. Or they'd say, I'm going to become a Christian when I get around to it. And I'd hand that to them. Had a lot of fun with that for several years. And some of you have good intentions, but let me tell you something. Death should remind us that none of us are promised our next breath. Theresa and I used to have a white mercury van. You remember that white mercury van, Theresa? It, it, it was a nice vehicle. Uh, we bought it used. It wasn't as nice as it was when it was new. But, you know, you can take and spray some of that new 
vehicle smelling stuff in a vehicle, and you, nobody will ever know it. And uh, we were driving back late one night from Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, back to Lebanon, Tennessee, where we now live. And as we was driving along, I was over in the passenger seat asleep, and uh, Theresa started, went frantic, you know, and woke me up, and I was starting, you know how you are when you're half dazed? I stay that way. And uh, antifreeze was spraying up on the windshield, and she was saying something about she hit something. I said, oh, you just blew a radiator hose. She said, I'm trying to tell you I hit a deer. And boy, let me tell you, she hit a deer. I can tell you that because I was picking deer parts out of that engine compartment and when I was trying to repair it. I know it was a deer. And so uh, we only carried liability insurance on that van. The next day, I called my insurance agent, who was a college friend of mine, and I said, Corky, how much would it cost us to get full coverage insurance on that white Mercury van? He said, you rascal, you, you wrecked that thing or you wouldn't be calling me. <laughs> and he was right. I knew he wasn't going to give me insurance. That's the reason, same reason, why if God is speaking to your heart today about becoming a Christian, he's spoken to you in days past and you've put him off and that you need to become a Christian because, you see, after you die, my friend, it's too late. In fact, Paul said, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, God is speaking, I helped you. Paul's commentary on the word was, behold, today is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Why should you, if you're not a Christian today, be saved. Well, I've told you several already, but let me kind of put it in organized form. First of all, you are a sinner. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm a sinner. Everybody in this room is a sinner. The only difference between me and you, if you're not a Christian, is that my sins are forgiven. And, and God forgives sins. He's a great God. He wants to forgive your sins. You said, Russ, you just don't know what I've done. God knows. And God uh, offers that forgiveness to you as uh, as far as the east is to the west, he will remove your sin. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. Though they be, uh, they could be as white as snow. Listen, my friend, your sins can be forgiven. It doesn't matter how hideous they are. You say, well, you know, Russ, I'm not that bad of a sinner. I've never been on skid row. I've never d killed anybody. But the only sin that matters is the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And if you have not received Him, you are rejecting Him. I'll tell you another reason why a person needs to be saved today. And it is not only because you need sin forgiven, but I'm telling you, I've already said, we're the ones enjoying life. It, 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 there's something about having fullness and meaning and purpose. Abundant life is the way Jesus described it. And you might think you're really living it up. You might think you're having a great time, but inside you know yourself. You go home at night with yourself. You know who you are. And let me tell you something, there's something rottening from the inside out in your life. You can have abundant life. One more thing. One of these days, if you haven't already figured it out, and if you don't, you, you know, know it by now, I don't know if you'll ever know it, but one of these days you're going to die. People that I know that uh, once were robust, they're getting frailer. Uh, even myself, I mean, I have problems, aches and pains I didn't have. I know that this body is deteriorating. Uh, you, you might say, well, Russ, uh, I, uh, I got a long time. No, you don't know that. Nobody knows that. Ask those people that went to the synagogue just nine days ago. They thought they had a long time, but nine days later, eight days later, the last one was buried. They didn't know, and neither do you. And whenever you die, there are no more chances. You can't get this assurance, just like I couldn't get insurance. Let me tell you something, my friend. You need to trust Jesus today because the Bible says after death, then comes the judgment. How does one become a Christian? Well, you repent. You turn away from a life without Jesus and turn to him in faith. You said, that's my problem, Russ. I can't have faith. I've been wronged. I've been stepped on so many times. I just can't have faith. Let me ask you something. How many, raise your hand. Make, let me make sure you're still awake and alive. How many of you arrived here in a car? Anybody? Everybody. I don't, anybody walk to church today? You live close enough to walk? Just one or two? That's fine. 
but most of us drove a car. And even if you walk today, you understand. you got faith in a machine. I doubt if any of us will have a prayer time and say, Dear God, help my car to start. I've driven vehicles like that before. But I doubt if anybody's thinking that right now. You've got faith in a machine, a man-made machine. You've got faith in other drivers that they haven't been so inebriated that they're going to come across the line or they're not texting and looking at their phone as many do today and, and they're, going to, they're going to stay on their side of the road. You've got faith in them. If you've got faith in that, surely you can have faith in the great God of the universe who made all the order that we have that has given us the oxygen that we breathe, provided water and food, and done all that for us, the God that sent Jesus to the cross on Calvary, surely you can have faith in Him if you can have faith in a machine and people that you don't even know and you don't know their track record. Don't tell me you can't have faith. It's a matter of surrender. You repent of a life without Jesus to become a Christian and to have salvation. You place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you turn your life totally over to him as your Lord, as your boss, the one that is now in charge. Let me ask you, there's a prayer on your sermon sheet. Does this prayer kind of sum up you? Dear God, I know that I am a sinner. Although I do not understand all about Jesus, I turn from my sin and turn to him in faith. I surrender my life to you now and forever. Come into my life and be my Savior and Lord. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to indicate anything at this moment. But does that prayer describe the desire of your heart? With all of death's reminders around us, the ones that we will see in the days ahead, the ones that we will encounter maybe even up close and personal, they should remind us to enjoy life every day. They should remind us also to live life and not build regret along the way, to avoid regret. And if you're here today without Jesus Christ, the fact that you know that you're going to die one of these days should encourage you, compel you, draw you to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior today. As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody looking around,